State of the Industry Podcast. This episode is brought to you by KP Movement Education, your source for health and movement education and coaching. Whether you are a health or fitness professional, a fitness consumer, or perhaps a passive bystander, KP believes that everyone deserves the right to pain-free movement. That's why their memberships and services are designed to educate, empower, and inspire you to create a culture of movement for yourself and those around you. With two membership options, You'll find education surrounding developing at-home training programs for yourself or for others, mental health and exercise, lifestyle medicine, and much, much more. Check it out at kineticperformance.ca backslash memberships. That's kineticperformance.ca backslash memberships. Hey, FitFam. Welcome back to the State of the Industry podcast. I am your host, Adam Yangsma. In this week's episode, we bring you part two of my conversation with Sheldon Persad. Sheldon has been coaching for over 30 years and his experience extends to coaching athletes who've competed at the World Championships, the Commonwealth Games, the Pan American Games, the Summer and Winter Olympics from close to two dozen different national team programs. He's the co-owner of Personal Best Health and Performance, the co-founder of the Certified Professional Trainers Network, the co-founding director of the Canadian Strength and Conditioning Association. He's an author, an award-winning international presenter, and the accolades just go on and on and on. This guy has done it all, and he is a true pioneer in both the personal training and the strength and conditioning fields here in Canada. I don't want to take any more of your time. I'm going to let him talk about it. So without any further ado, let's dive right in. All right, we're back with Sheldon Persaud, and I actually want to pick up right where we left off in part number one. And we finished by talking about the kind of mental side, needing a mental break often with training. And I wanted to get into the psychology of coaching a little bit and um, how you work with the clients that you deal with with regards to staying mentally strong, but also monitoring that as well. So first, can you just speak to a little bit about what um, the importance is of the kind of mental state of the clients that you train with? Well, when I I actually, as a mature, or as my wife says, immature student, went went back to grad school to, uh, to do some research and I did cross-disciplinary work. So I actually looked at the physiological and psychological effects of, of overtraining and detraining. And one of the areas that was, and so I had two supervisors, essentially, one who was physiology-based, one who was you know, psychology and psychologist-based. Yeah. And for me, when, when things like overtraining uh, are occurring, or if they're you know, problematic in terms of unplanned or unstructured overreaching, is that the you know, psychological aspects become paramount. And one thing that I actually did in my research is I, I would track how the athletes, I looked at Ironman triathletes over a year, how they were feeling and asking that, that simple question, how do you feel correlated really highly with things like heart rate variability and, and some of the physiological measures that I was taking. Now it, it's contingent upon the individual being honest in mm-hmm. their responses, but if you can consistently ask the question, how do you feel and track that over time, you can get some really meaningful data. And we've talked about, you know, technology and tools being something that's changed over the last little bit, but here is a no cost uh, opportunity item that we can track that is super simple. All you need is a pen and paper or Excel spreadsheet and just tracking how you feel which I do myself personally every mm-hmm. morning uh, before I do my workout. Uh, and again, as long as it's consistently at the same time of day, just tracking that is huge. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and in terms of, of going beyond that, because I really have, that's an area that I do not know enough about. And I want to spend more time learning about the, the psychology of the game. So I did spend half a year studying at the 
at the Canadian Institute of Stress it, it, through the Hans Selye Foundation. Mm -hmm. And that was a massive learning opportunity to be able to learn from, from somebody like, uh, you know, Richard Earl, Dr. Richard Earl, who worked hand in hand with Hans Selye was phenomenal learning. And, and again, as, as coaches, um, coaches are, uh, you know, do have to have their pulse on how our athletes, how our, our clients are feeling uh, on a psychological basis. I think that's absolutely key. Yeah, because you're a, you're a stress and wellness consultant as well, right? So that's Correct. a big piece of what you do is in that stress side. Um, so do you have, uh, because I'm also, I'm also interested in this as well. Um, do you have some resources that, um, that listeners could use to gain a better understanding about the kind of stress and psychology side of training? Yeah, if, uh, quite honestly, simply, um, you, know, you can Google the Canadian Institute of Stress. And they can see a lot of the, the literature and even some of the books that uh, Dr. Earl has written on the topic. Because I remember I took, um, I was actually probably in our max class when I took this because we actually went to the university together at Laurier. Um, and I remember we took a, uh, a psychology of sports course together. And uh, it, it, like, it's, it blew my mind because it's a rabbit hole when you start getting into the psychology of, of training, the psychology of athletes, uh, and even with the general population getting to the psychology behind why the client first came in, why they want to work with you, why they have the goals that they've set out or they've told you about. And um, with them, often I find it's, um, it's, a, it's a learning process. There's a lot of questions that need to be asked in the initial kind of consultation with that client because a lot of the wants and needs, they overlap a little bit, but there needs to be some education there as well with regards to what they actually need versus what they want. Um, within your own um, training with your own company, it, how much time do you spend in your initial con consultation just talking with your clients? It's all talking. Yeah. It's, okay. that's, that's all we do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, I got a lot of people who almost skip over that trying to get to all of the uh, physical measurements, you know, the uh, body composition, um, heart rate, blood pressure, getting into the strength and cardiorespiratory measurements as well within that consultation, because usually we do the assessment and consult is kind of all in one, um, just for time's sake. But um, yeah, they kind of skip through. And um, I used to manage a couple of facilities and you see them walk into the consultation 30 minutes later, they're on the floor working through the assessment. I'm like, what have you learned in half an hour about that client? How much rapport have you built with that client with regards to them trusting that you have their best interests um, at heart? Um, so how do you, let's talk about a bit about that. Bit about that. How, how do you really help your clients gain uh, a trust in you? How do you develop rapport with somebody brand new who you're working with? Well, I think it really comes down to listening as much as we can. And I, I, I try to be in tune with body language and eye contact. And I have had situations where uh, I was actually at what one comes to mind, it was the mom of a cyclist that I was working with. And, and the cyclist asked if I could start working with her mom. And the cyclist who's a, a, an athlete's goal for the mom was to lose weight, but I never heard that from the mom. So and in the first meeting, you know, you know we, she, she, it was something that she mentioned that others had a goal for her about, but uh, you know, when we really got down to it, that was not, the mom's goal or objective. I, and I think that if, if we're looking at people and, and when she walked in, I could tell she was nervous because she assumed that we were going to do um, uh, measurements. Yeah. You know, get there. So that if, if I had, if I had taken the calipers out and if I had taken the tape measure out, that would have been the worst possible thing for me to do for that individual. Like yeah. I think it's really trying to be as much, and it's, it's always uh, an evolution of learning and, and I think just having an understanding of an individual psyche and what their needs are. Uh, so I think Adam, to answer your question, it's really trying to do as best as I can to listen. Yeah. So with the young athletes that you work with, 
do you often have, um, I don't want to say a problem or an issue, but do you often have parents trying to almost speak over the child or the young, the young athlete or, um, you know, respond to questions that you ask specifically to the athlete and they respond and said, do you have that a lot? And then what do you do in those circumstances? Oh, hundred percent. I mean, one of the, one of the worlds that I was heavily involved in, in the nineties was, uh, figure skating. Mm. And I, and I used to run into, um, you know, challenges with mom says one thing, um, the son says another thing, or dad says something, and the daughter says something completely opposite. So what I actually started doing in that environment is I would have a little uh, 15 point questionnaire that I would give to the athletes understanding what do you like? What do you enjoy? What do you not like? So I would actually have the athletes fill that out while I was talking to mom and dad. Hmm. So, you know, and that way I can see if there is incongruency between the responses, but it, 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 it created a situation or a scenario where um, the athlete was able to provide feedback without being fear of mom and dad judging the responses. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's like, if you're working with young athletes and for you, um, you know, whether they're Olympics level athletes or not that could be, that's a long relationship. And if the parent is always the one speaking in, uh, that's really, really a a difficult thing to navigate when the parent is is speaking over the child. Because you want to know, as as you said, you want to know what what do you actually enjoy? Like, is this something that you want to do, you know, whether it be professionally or, or at a really high level, is this just something you just love doing and you just do it for the fun of it, right? So, I'm going to ask a very, very short question here. What is kind of your um, definition on coaching? Like what is coaching to you? Teaching, mentoring, you know, listening, being there. Mm. So when you're in a, if you were to do, if you're doing a live session with a client, if you're maybe not right now, but you know, if you were working with a client before uh, this pandemic hit, um, what would be the the big, like kind of walk through some of the questions that you're asking at the beginning of that session, once they've entered your door, and then the questions that you're asking kind of throughout, and then at the end of that session that assist you in, because you're monitoring things all the time, right? As, as trainers, as strength and conditioning specialists, we're constantly, as you said, watching body language, we're watching performance, we're evaluating just, you know, um, the fatigue level, like how fatigued do our, our clients look in those scenarios? So what are some of the kind of your go-tos that you're constantly trying to um, assist in the, I guess, success of the athlete within the session itself? So it, that's an important question in terms of what the goals are of the session and what's the goal of the program. So that's what one thing that we'll try and do. You know, what are we going to try and, what's the objective today and what's the objective this week? Uh, and uh, the reverse side of that coin, and I'll think of a weekend warrior athlete that I used to work with. I, I actually used to work in a facility that had a golf net, a pool table, and a table tennis board. <laughs> in some cases, just based on the aura or, or, or you know, how they entered the facility, you know, say, you know what, it, it, today's not a day for a workout. Let's, let's go and uh, use the golf net or let's go and play some table tennis instead. And I think... Yeah. That's, you know, that's going to be much more of a, a psychological boost than trying to, to grudge through a workout when your heart is just not in it. Yeah. Yeah. I've got, um, like, I've got a, this short questionnaire that I use when I was doing in-person training before this, uh, that I asked every single time they came in. And it was, um, because I wasn't at, before all this, I wasn't really tracking, Um, specific numbers. It was a lot of questionnaires and asking the questions, as you said, about how do you feel, but it was relating to how is your nutrition today? How is your water intake today? How's your energy today? How, what's your mood today? Right. Just very simple questionnaire. And they're all graded on this one to 10 scale. And then I've got kind of this thing, if they're below this, we have a, we have kind of a recovery day, mobility day. If they're at this, we, okay, we know we can push them a little bit more if they're at that high end. Right. And so there's this this uh, continuum that they could be on um, with regard to the training to help me guide what I do, because a lot of trainers will set up, this is what you're doing today. Let's push hard. And why aren't you pushing harder? Right. They don't ask the questions to get the information. So I like that it's constantly education, but and like teaching, but also listening and asking the right questions I feel is, is really, really important for, for trainers. 
One thing that Charlie Francis used to do, a phenomenal track coach, amazing, a really smart guy. And, and obviously we know that he used to coach Ben Johnson. Is, and I used to watch him closely when we were at the track because we used to do workouts at the same time. And he would, at times, he would actually listen to the foot contact of his athletes and based on how light or heavily they were landing, he would structure and modify the workout. I mean, brilliant guy. And actually, that's a pretty good book if you ever, you know, to be able to read Speed Trap, Charlie Francis's book is a good read if you get a chance. Speed Trap. Well, I'm assuming that's going to be in your book list at the top three. That's funny. So. No, actually, it isn't. It just oh, it isn't? Oh, right. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to write that down because I'm going to read that. Um, yeah, watching good coaches. I love that. Like, that's, I'm constantly... I was managing a couple of different facilities and I had, I think 13, 14 trainers underneath me at this time. And, you know, I was supposed to be the one, you know, in charge, the one that knew everything, but I was constantly walking the floor, not to watch what they're doing. And like, as a hawk trying to, but because a lot of them, like there was some who were bodybuilders who knew a lot more about that side of the training than I did. So I'd watch what they're doing and I'd ask them questions like, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? More so for, to get information rather than try to correct anything. Um, I, I like, I love watching coaches. I love even, um, you know, when you were saying that he, he was listening to the actual foot contacts, like the amount of experience necessary to do something like that is like that's that's phenomenal that he has the ear the knowledge the experience to be able to do something like that because i couldn't imagine doing that right now with a sprint athlete right i just i just couldn't imagine doing that right now um but yeah having that like, type of experience would be awesome all right let's switch gears because i've been dying to talk about this let's talk about the um the csca the canadian strength and conditioning uh, association. Now, can you just introduce the audience to um, what it is and why you guys, because you are the um, one of the directors, one of the co-founders of it. Why did you guys start it? What is it here for? And what do you hope to kind of get from? I know it's a loaded question. It's three <laughs> questions in one. Just talk us through it. Yeah. Well, again, what we're trying to do is, is really, um, Create uh, an association where collaboration with SNC coaches across Canada is at the forefront. Uh, but not only looking at the collaboration, but, but again, also looking at how we're educating ourselves and, and how we're educating ourselves within the world of SNC. There are some brilliant minds in Canada that I am uncertain if we celebrate enough. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one thing that we'd like to do. You know, another thing, and it's in, it's in our vision, is we would like to be able to you know, offer a roadmap or a pathway in terms of what the life or what a career of an SNC coach should look like or can look like. And then another part of it is, is wanting to be able to also educate the consumer as to what an SNC coach is and what an SNC coach does and what, what an SNC coach can provide for for an individual, whether that individual is a weekend warrior athlete or uh, an up and coming provincial athlete or a national uh, team Olympic athlete. I think having that understanding to, you know, getting that understanding out there and putting out there in terms of the consumer uh, would also help in terms of, um, I think, make us more employable by being able to be able to share that. Yeah. Um, cause I, me, much like you, like part of the NSCA have our CSCS, right. Strength and conditioning association, um, in the States. And so when I saw the CSCA, I was like, Oh, interesting. You know, um, I was really interested to find out kind of what it's about. So when it comes to the development, why did it, cause it's relatively new. Why did it take so long to kind of get, it, uh, get going? We have been talking about it uh, for 20 years in terms of actually creating it. Yeah. And I, I am a firm believer that things happen when they should. And, and perhaps 20, 15, even 10, we were very close roughly 10 years ago of getting it off the ground and it still stalled for one reason or another. And I, I mean, I'm not gonna dwell on the reasons why, yeah. but I think you know, we are now ready uh, to be able to support this association. And I think the, 
the feedback that we've been receiving because the, the focus of our articles have all been really about sharing information and sharing about what some SNC coaches are doing across Canada. That's been sort of paramount. Yeah. And the feedback has been excellent so far. Uh, this Seattle yeah, Giant Show. I mean, it's only been um, just over a year since we actually started things. Yeah. And so um, what type of education do, um, like, where are you guys pointing people with regards to the education for the the industry? Because I know, as you said, like, um, it's often difficult both in the personal training as well as the strength and conditioning to have um, some level of of standard with regards to what people are learning and, and staying on top. A lot of people have a hard time maybe sifting through a hundred different uh, research articles every day as they all come out in floods. Um, so how are you sifting through that and how are you helping SNC coaches and directing them towards better education? Yeah, I think it starts with great mentorship. And uh, if, you know, if there's one article that I would encourage people to read, it is a, an article on you know, an SNC mentorship tree uh, that was written by uh, Chris Chapman. And mm -hmm. it is a phenomenal article. So if you can find that on, uh, on, our, on our website, but I, I think, and I firmly believe, and we're, we're on you know, sort of the same page as well, not only in terms of the advisory team that we have in place, but also our board that uh, it's, it's a mentorship structure that we're going to be trying to create across the nation. Yeah. And so how will that, um, how will that mentorship system work for a young S and C um, individual? Yeah, that's we're we're in the process of creating that right now. <laughs> yeah. And so will that be something that is, uh, yeah, I, I know you probably maybe not don't have the answer, but will that be something that is, um, as soon as they get a certification and or get a position, or is that something that anybody at any stage can then take a part of? Well, it's 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 something of. that anybody at any stage can can be a part of, and I think you know a, a common theme not only in Chris Chapman's article but a common theme in many of the articles, in many of the interviews is establishing you know who are your mentors. Create that right now. Um, you know, in the last most recent newsletter that went out in July, our summer newsletter, uh, one of the strength coaches out east, uh, he, he's in PEI, wrote an article and said that was the, you know, one of the biggest gaps he had in starting his career is not being able to have that mentorship or have somebody that uh, he's able to rely on and feeling somewhat isolated in, in PEI. So I think that is something that does not need any formal program. Yeah. But I absolutely encourage every single one of us can be a mentor and every single one of us can be a mentee. And I think it's important to be able to be both and to serve both roles because the learning is an absolute two-way street. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I was blessed when I first started. So when I graduated from Kin, I got a job almost immediately as a kinesiologist working in a sports medicine clinic. And I wasn't an SNC coach at the time. I wasn't uh, a personal trainer at the time. I was just kind of looking to get into rehab because that's where my brain was at at that moment was getting into that. And I was so lucky to um, be put into a situation where there were some very, very fresh PTs who had just um, left uh, physiotherapy school and are in this clinic. So it was a very young team. And they were just so eager, so willing to teach and learn because it's them being a mentor actually help them learn better and solidify what they know and problem solve. And uh, even when talking with clients of theirs, be able to explain things in a more uh, lay term way with, uh, you know, kind of taking the jargon that we understand that we learn and then putting it into more lay terms for. And so I, I was so blessed to be able to have that. And that's actually one of the reasons why I ended up getting into education in the first place is because I just, I loved the teaching, the, the mentoring side of whether managing a facility or even working with a client. I just love teaching. So I was, I would sit there and like, it may have made me not the best PT in the world or strength and conditioning coach. I would just love telling people why you're about to do what you're doing and what's happening within the body with regards to, you know, the neuromuscular system, with regards to the fascial system, with regards to the proprioception, like all of this stuff, trying to like, this is why you're doing what you're doing. And I just loved giving them that information. So um, I really look forward actually to having the opportunity when, when you guys get that off the ground to being able to experience some of that because um, 
I just bought a new house and it's going to have a nice little gym in the basement with my office. Awesome. So um, it'll be a location where I'm able to do not only some virtual stuff, but even, you know, when things clear up, have people come in as well and do some one-on-one stuff in there. Um, And I'm going to be trying to work with a whole bunch of the uh, rehab clinics in the area, trying to bring people in as they've kind of either gotten out of rehab or they're at that stage where they need a little bit more training uh, being able to utilize my skills in that that stage so the client doesn't you know go home not do anything come back and they're pretty much where they were when they left um, yeah so I'm really looking forward to that because I love that is there a um, a certification in the future of the CSCA so of our three phases, so we've outlined a five-year plan in our strat plan. That's, that's actually on the website. So the first phase is the collaboration. The second phase is the education. The third phase is standardization. Mm-hmm. So in terms of the standardization, and we've mapped out roughly three to five years within our, our five-year strat plan, uh, that's where we're going to be looking at and exploring that. So I can't say definitively yes at this mm-hmm. point, but what we are looking at doing is, is being able to uh, create agreed upon standards that, and when I say agreed upon, we have representation from coast to coast yeah. in terms of this is what an SNC coach should look like. This is what an SNC coach should be able to provide. So that is something we are definitely working towards uh, in terms of whether it works into a certification or accreditation. Let's talk again in two years from now. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, because I saw, yeah, whenever I see that, I'm like, oh, I'm- I'm looking for it. Not that, you know, getting more letters really means all that much, but um, having a Canadian SNC representation, I think is great because the NSCA has been predominantly uh, a U.S. Um, thing, like Canadian individuals can get it, but it's been a predominantly like U.S. Um, thing there. So uh, yeah, having Canadian representation in that and, and serving the population, the uh, different types of athletes that we deal with here in Canada and the different facilities that we have, the different levels, I think will be uh, fantastic to have something like that. So um, one, congratulations on actually getting that off the ground finally after, you know, 20 years of trying to figure that all out. And um, yeah, just wish you guys best of luck. And I really look forward to what you guys have going on there. So well, thank you. And thank you. And I, I'll, I'll put a little bit of a plug, a shameless plug in here that people <laughs> need to go on the Canadian strength and conditioning website and subscribe to the newsletter, which is free. Yeah. So simply just go on there and subscribe. Done. Done. Um, all right. So I want to do a little bit of a lightning round because I'm always interested in doing asking these three questions to find out um, what the individuals who I've talked with, the guests that I've had on, uh, where kind of their mind, because everybody's a little bit interesting. When you ask them kind of three best books or mentors, they're always you always get very, very different answers. So I like kind of seeing where the brain's at at that time. Um, and since you brought up mentors, I'm actually going to start with that question first. So who are your top three mentors through your journey thus far? Um, it can be specifically with regards to uh, strength and conditioning or stress, like doesn't matter business, who are your top three mentors? Number one is easy. The, the best, most amazing man uh, that I know on the face of the planet is my dad. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, he absolutely, my, my dad's a, a physician, a doctor, and, and he's, he's been sort of a chief examiner within the country, within his practice, which meant at a certain point in time, in order to be that specialist, you would have to be approved by my dad. Mm-hmm. But so brilliant, he's written chapters, he's written books, but he's been a far better, most amazing dad than he has been a physician. So number one, easy, slam dunk my dad. Uh, number two would be my business partner, Barry Shepley. And, and that's been a type of relationship because Barry, Barry is, is such a kind, you know, selfless individual. And he is a big picture thinker. Me, on the other hand, I'm, I'm more of a detail guy. Yeah. So our, our partnership and our relationship, you know, which started before we began our company, has been an amazing blessing in my life. And we have learned, uh, you know, equally from each other. So there are times where he's my most amazing mentor. And there are times when, when, when you know, I've been his mentor. So that would be number two. And then number three, because this is one of the questions you sent prior to number three, difficult. I can't pick a third one, but what I would do is I would categorize some of the amazing 
Olympic and national team coaches I've had the opportunity to work with. So I can think of, you know, Adrian Trudesso, who is, who's a boxing coach that, that I learned from, you know, not only going back 15 years ago when I first met him till, you know, uh, sadly a few years ago, he passed away, but, you know, not only learning from him, but being able to coach um, the very last Olympic athlete he coached and I'm still working with her to this day. So, you know, people like that, people like Andy Higgins, who was an amazing Olympic coach, track coach as well. Awesome opportunity to learn from him. And, and, you know, I could go on down the list of probably half a dozen of phenomenal coaches that I've, I've been mentored by and learned from, because I think it's important as SNC to be able to learn from coaches. And, and I'm a huge proponent of the National Coaching Certification Program. And, and I encourage yeah. people to be certified through that program as much as often and as, as often as possible. Yeah. But yeah, that, that would be three. You know, my dad, uh, Barry, and then uh, a collection of coaches that I've worked with. Awesome. And I, and I love that. Like, like education never stops. Like if you stop learning, uh, as you said, if you're the smartest person in the room, you got to find a new room. So you surround yourself with people who are smarter than you, but just because they're smarter than you doesn't mean that you can't feed them and they can't feed you with that. Right. And so I love that, um, you know, with your business partner and um, all the other SNC coaches and even your dad, right. Being able to learn from each other um, and just putting yourself in the best position to be successful by surrounding yourself with good people, smart people um, who compliment you, right? There's a lot of, um, I find a lot of trainers who want to surround themselves with people who think like they think. They don't like being in a room with people who don't think what they think, but I actually find that's actually better, right? Because you actually sharpen each other. You get better at defending why you maybe think a certain way um, and it can help you really grow in uh, strength and conditioning and personal training, um, any type of uh, consulting kind of field that they're in. A hundred percent. And I think that the perfect example there is actually Barry's wife, Karen, who, who's, you know, joined us and, and, you know, started helping with us, you know, within months, within a, a year to a month of, of us starting our company. And she's being sort of a glue that's been able to hold us together as well. <laughs> she's heavily involved in, and she, uh, she's a little bit of both of us. She's, she's a big picture thinker and also detail. So it's, it's such, it's such a nice relationship that, uh, that we have. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, okay, so next one, top three books that you've read on any topic. The first one is uh, Soul of a Butterfly, Muhammad Ali, because Muhammad Ali is one of my favorite athletes ever, all time, regardless of sport. I think, you know, the way he performed, what he did, you know, spending three years under suspension because of uh, a belief of not going to war and then coming back to regain his, his title. I, I like Soul of a Butterfly because it's not just all about boxing. Mm -hmm. uh, he does talk about boxing. It is an autobiography, but he talks about uh, family. He talks about interactions with fans. He talks about interactions with other other athletes too. So um, that's that's number one. And number two would be uh, Start With Why, uh, yep. Simon Sinek book, and and a close sort of two A two B. So a two B would be um, The Purple Cow yep. um, by Gordon Ben. And and I like the marketing angle that that he talks about that. And the third one, the third one would be the uh, would would be my Bible. And that's the last thing I, I read a passage of my Bible uh, before I go to bed. And it's, uh, you know, I read a passage, a devotional passage, the first thing I read every morning. And I've been nice. doing that for, for years. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, so the only book there that I haven't read is Soul of a Butterfly. So I'm going to have to read that because uh, I've read the other three. So um, yeah, I got to get on that for sure. And then obviously Speed Trap, I got to get on that too. Um, a couple more books add to my list. And then what would Sheldon of today say to 20 year old Sheldon? Yeah, that's easy. Read more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, so Adam, I was, uh, I'm a massive movie fan and movie buff. And, and yeah. my dad and I used to watch TV all Saturday night movies, Saturday night movies for years. And he's the one that turned me into movies. So I, I love film. I love film history. Um, you know, one of my part-time jobs during school was working at a video store so I could get more movies for free at the time. <laughs> so nice. I have spent a lot of time in the dark watching movies. Yeah. And I think if I were to, to tell, you know what, read a little bit more. That would yeah. be <laughs> advice I'd give myself. Yeah. Yeah. The occasional movie, it's okay. Um, but yeah, like I talk about this with clients and students a lot when we're talking about wasted time 
right? Time that could be spent bettering yourself, improving, um, even just relaxing, right? Because TV and movies um, aren't the same as reading when it comes to relaxation and, and its, its effects on the brain, which is why you're typically supposed to turn off electronics and turn off your TV, you know, um, at least an hour or two before you go to bed and, and typically read, dim the lights, you know, try to get into that state. So um, I like that you said read more because that's something... I would have liked to do a lot more when I was younger. Now I was an athlete, like I was a, like just, I was playing a hundred different sports every single day, every second I could be outside, I was outside. Um, and then when I wasn't, I was probably playing maybe a video game or two or watching a movie or something like that. I wasn't necessarily into TV and shows, but movies for sure. Like I'm a movie guy as well. Like if my wife gives me the option to watch a show, like a couple episodes of a show or watch a movie, it's always a movie versus a show. Cause I feel like, for me, it's like, I feel like I have to continue watching more and more episodes because it's just never ending. But a movie's like got to start and an end. So I know how much time I'm allotting to it and then it's over and I'm done, I can move on. Um, but I love I love that you said that, read more. Um, I'd also like to read faster too. I don't know if that would have mattered much, but that's I think my biggest problem right now. I actually love reading, but I have three books on the go and they're all about, you know, a half to a three quarters finish. And it just takes me so long to get through it. So I try doing some audible while I'm like flipping through. So I do it at about one and a half speeds and just follow along. And then when I catch something, I underline it and, you know, write some notes if I need to, but yeah. Uh, okay. So you've already done a shameless plug, but I'll allow you to do a couple more if you would like. So do you have any products, projects that you're currently working on um, that you would like to promote? Sure, again, so we've already mentioned subscribing to the CSCA newsletter, that'd be great. Uh, Personal Best, our company, we actually run an endurance training summit every year. Uh, we've done it, uh, both Barry and I and Karen uh, went to McMaster University. So for, for you know 18 years, we ran it at McMaster. Last year was the first time we ran it at a different location in Toronto. This year it's gonna be virtual and it's typically in the fall. So. Uh, personalbest.ca is our website. So you'd be able to find information going up in the next couple of weeks on the summit. Uh, and yeah, I guess that would be it. Awesome. And then um, where can the audience go to find more uh, about you and what you do? Maybe if they're interested, I guess, you know, if they're interested in getting into uh, strength and conditioning, going to the uh, CSCN website to, or sorry, CSA website to try to, you know, find out some more information about that. Um, but is there anywhere else other than your personal best website or anything where they can find out more about you? Yeah, those two would be probably the best through okay. the, the CSCA and also through personalbest.ca. Uh, right. Contact information is there. Awesome. Um, well, it's been a pleasure. I have a mass of notes, um, a list of some books I have to read and some things I have to research. Uh, but I really appreciate you coming on and, um, and taking the time to uh, educate me and educate our audience as well. So I really appreciate it. Thanks, Adam. I appreciate the opportunity. All right. And we'll have you on in two years when we figure out what's going on with that certification <laughs> and a, mentorship program. It's a deal. All right. Take care. You too. State of the Industry Podcast. I'll be back.